We're a nonprofit organization dedicated to eradicating human slavery, human trafficking, child exploitation, and child sexual abuse material through disrupting networks and applying data, technology, and advanced analytics and intelligence. Hi, everybody. My name is Aaron Kaler. I'm the founder and CEO of the Anti-Human Trafficking Intelligence Initiative, and I'm your moderator for today's panel, which is the Anti-Human Trafficking NGO Collaboration for Accelerated Impact panel. Uh, extremely excited to be here today and have all our distinguished guests representing uh, their own respective NGOs that work hard uh, in the anti-human trafficking and, and CSAM space. We have Sarah Crow, the Strategic Initiatives Director at Polaris, uh, Rochelle Kihan, the CEO of Collective Liberty, Stasha Sheehan, the, Nash, uh, the Vice President of the Analytical Services Division at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NICMEC, and Michael DiTerno, the Operations Manager for The Noble. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today uh, and, and supporting us with at the Anti-Human Trafficking Intelligence Initiative for our Follow Money, Fight Slavery second annual summit. Um, we're gonna start out with uh, a brief bio from everybody uh, on their background and, 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 and what they do in the industry and a little bit on, on each of your organizations. Uh, so I'll start with Sarah from, from Polaris. Thank you, Aaron, and thanks for inviting me. Um, so as Aaron said, I work at Polaris, which is a US-based nonprofit dedicated to ending sex and labor trafficking. Um, some of our work is more global in nature, but we primarily focus on sex and labor trafficking occurring in the United States and in North America. Um, our largest program is that we operate the U.S. National Human Trafficking Hotline, which is a 24-hour hotline for victims and survivors that can reach out, get connected to support in their area, uh, report to law enforcement. It is a confidential hotline, um, and we are able to take calls in all different languages. That's actually where I got my start 11 years ago um, in the anti-trafficking movement. I started as a hotline advocate, so taking calls on that hotline. So I've actually handled thousands of trafficking cases through that hotline. Um, but from this program and our other work with survivors who are really um, the true experts on human trafficking, we um, have all of this information, all of this data, which uh, we utilize combined with other data sources and try to look for really strategic ways to uh, disrupt and prevent human trafficking. So my team now is the financial intelligence unit. We work specifically with the financial services industry to understand what human trafficking looks like help financial institutions detect it and better respond to it. Um, and that is uh, the current, my current role. Thank you so much, Sarah. Rochelle? Hi everyone, my name is Rochelle Cahan and I'm the founder and CEO of Collective Liberty. So glad to be here with you all. Um, I was a prosecutor in Philadelphia for six years and I tried the first two trafficking trials in the state. I became a DA the same year we had our first statewide statute on trafficking. So I share all that to say that my main focus in the national movement is all of those legislators, prosecutors, um, investigators that are drowning in the sea of, oh my gosh, we have no case study, no precedents, no data, all of our stuff stuck within one jurisdiction. So when the case is going outside the jurisdiction, we don't have a mandate and trying to solve that for them because I lived through it and it was really overwhelming. And as the investigator and the prosecutor, you're the one looking in the face of the victim or survivor and telling them about the deficiencies in the system. So it's emotionally, you're the front line. And so those are my people where I'm like, let me just lift the burden on you a little bit. Of course, at the center of that is making sure we're doing right by survivors. But the people first coming into contact with them, if they're not equipped, they can't do right by the survivors. So I collected Liberty. We curate data across the nation uh, to help build out those cases. And our team is all current and former law enforcement and survivors. So we know what data to pull and how to connect it. And we have our own proprietary AI system that's helping not only collect and structure it, but analyze it in the back end so that we can quickly and promptly provide analytical support to our partners in 
both the law enforcement space and the AML investigation space, anyone investigating trafficking at an official level, um, we provide that assistance too. Maybe Stasa's next? Yeah, she is, Stasa. Hi, thank you so much for having us here today. My name is Stasa Sheehan and I'm a vice president at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, where I've had the pleasure of working for the past 23 years. Our organization is a private, nonprofit, non-governmental organization that was founded in 1984 by John and Reve Walsh after the tragic events in which their son, Adam, was abducted and murdered. And the Walsh family came together after that tragedy and channeled their anger and frustration into a more coordinated national response to the issues of missing and exploited children. The National Center is congressionally designated to operate 15 different programs of work related to missing and exploited children. Clearly, I'm not going to be able to cover all of them today. I'm going to focus in on those that are specific to child sex trafficking. Simply stated, our mission is to help find missing children, to reduce child sexual exploitation, and to prevent further victimization. And you can probably see that each one of those mission areas connects with the issue of child sex trafficking. Those primary programs that intersect with child sex trafficking are the intake of missing children. We have assisted law enforcement in over 376,000 recoveries of missing children. And while not all missing children are child sex trafficking victims and not all victims of child sex trafficking are missing children, they are a vulnerable population to being targeted and recruited for this crime. So that's where the direct connection takes place. We also operate the Cyber Tip Line, a global reporting mechanism for child sexual exploitation online. We've received over 116 million Cyber Tip Line reports to date. The largest category is related to child sexual abuse material. The second is related to online enticement of children for sexual acts. And the third is child sex trafficking. And then as part of both of those programs of work, we offer analytical resources to law enforcement and prosecutors, leveraging the public-private model of the ability of a nonprofit to receive donations of both technology and data that we're able to add value to the tips and the leads that come in and develop leads and intelligence on potential child sex trafficking that's occurring through using sources like LexisNexis, Thomson Reuters, and TransUnion, coupled with trafficking specific technology, OSINT or online open source analysis, as well as access to NCIC and NLITS. So with that, I'm going to throw it back to our moderator and uh, want to thank all the other uh, panel participants as well. I'm looking forward to participating with you. Thank you. Mr. Mike DiTerno. All right. Well, thank you. And good morning, everyone. Thank you for making time to attend this session today. This is very important information. But my name is Mike DiTerno. Uh, I've been full-time operations manager with the Noble since October of 2021. Prior to that, uh, I spent the previous 15 years at PNC Bank, where I held responsibility for their entire fraud investigations operation, but I had also held roles in fraud prevention, fraud detection, and also fraud uh, online and cyber fraud investigation. Uh, aside from that, my background is in data, business intelligence, and analytical work. The Noble was founded in uh, 2019 by Ian Mitchell, who's also a career fraud fighter spent his career in the financial industry doing similar work, managing investigative functions and, and that. But Noble is also a nonprofit, similar to other organizations represented on the call here today. And if, if I were to summarize what the cornerstone of the Noble is all about, you know, where we play in this space, it's about awakening, equipping, and deploying effective tools, strategies, and techniques to the financial industry, to our financial partners to help identify uh, transactional activity, uh, you know, indicative of human trafficking or child exploitation, things like that. Um, giving, you know, collect collaboration through partnerships across the industry, bringing folks together who do the same job, people who show up to do their investigation or their fraud analytics work every day. You know, they, they're the ones who can touch those things those transactions by giving them the information and, and giving them the, the, you know, helping arm them maybe with some best practices from someone else in the financial industry who's 
who's maybe leading the way on this or maybe you know doing something more we can all learn from each other and we can all help raise the bar and do a better job of prevent preventing and detecting these sorts of crimes by working together so again that that's really what the noble is about with our cornerstone being um, really arming and equipping the financial industry with the tools and techniques that they need to to help prevent and detect this sort of activity. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we we just had our uh, keynote speaker Ronnie Hong from Freedom Seal, who is a, a survivor of human trafficking, talk about uh, her experiences, her organization, and and some basics uh, uh, on human trafficking. Um, we do want to quickly uh, give an overview uh, of trafficking from, from our perspective in, in, the, in the, not just in the financial uh, realm, but also from an NGO perspective and how we look at things from, from an overview of trafficking. So Rochelle uh, from Collective Liberty is gonna speak on that quickly. Yeah, just briefly to not be uh, repetitive, uh, Ronnie's great, is the when you hear us referring to trafficking throughout the organizations on this panel right now, we're going to be talking about whenever a trafficker or a trafficking network uses force, fraud, or coercion to force someone into the situation. And we really like to talk about it through the action means purpose model of an exploiter, what actions that exploiter took to help to basically force fraud, defraud or coerce someone into either forced sex or forced labor. And there are some nuances in that. If they're under 18, forced fraud or coercion is pretty much irrelevant for most of our definitions here. And what we really like to highlight is sex work is not default per, like per se trafficking. People who are working that don't have full documentation, it's not per se trafficking. So you have to look for the overall context. And that's why we like to focus on the exploiters, the traffickers, and the exploitation networks and what they're doing. And we really encourage everyone else to do that as well. If all you're doing is looking for victims, you're not going to find the exploitation and you're going to end up also misidentifying quite often. Um, so... I don't know if you guys wanted to add anything, but that's what we're talking about. The rest of this call, when we talk about trafficking, is sp exploiters specifically engaging in forced fraud or coercion, and no consent is really there. You're muted. Stacey, anything to add to that uh, quickly, or are you... The only thing I could add is that I believe all of us on the call also further define the exploiters as an independent, unrelated third party, often referred to as a pimp or a trafficker. It could also be a family member of the victim or a perceived family member, someone the child or adult refers to as an auntie or an uncle, but they may not really be blood relatives. Could also be gang members or it could be the buyers themselves that are perpetrating the crime of trafficking without that additional third party facilitating in between. Thank you. So, so moving along, um, prior to starting uh, the Anti-Human Trafficking Intelligence Initiative in, in 2019, I spent 20 years in regulatory compliance, anti-money laundering compliance and financial crimes. Um, Back in 2014, FinCEN, uh, from part of the IRS uh, that focuses on financial crime regulation, started giving guidance around human trafficking. Um, in 2000, I want to say 2018, they gave additional guidance and really put um, human trafficking on the radar of financial institutions. Um, in 2017, uh, they added a checkbox for human trafficking to the suspicious activity report that is filed by financial institutions everywhere. Uh, it's a really exciting time to see financial institutions getting guidance and being, being asked to do more around human trafficking because we all know that human trafficking is a financial crime uh, as well. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about the connection to financial services and financial crime in human trafficking and, and, and CSAM child sexual abuse material. 
Uh, so to start that off, uh, I'll hand it over to Mike. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> You know, and, and as I said before, not to be repetitive, but, you know, the real cornerstone of the noble is around the integration with financial institutions, because, you know, when you think about the money flow for these illicit acts, you know, th this money is flowing through our financial and transactional systems, just like our cell payments for our cell phone bills, you know, our debit card transactions, the gas station, you name it, this money is, is flowing right alongside numerous legitimate transactions as well. And, you know, but the difference, and this is the key, and, you know, this is what personally draws me to this work. And I know it just what resonates with the other folks on this call behind every one of those illicit transactions is a person. It's, it's a person, it's someone's livelihood, someone's, you know, brother, mother, sister, daughter, some person. So the, the ability, the indicators of this activity are very clearly in our transactional systems today. The good news, you know, this is good news story. The good news is that this sort of activity is very identifiable. It's very detectable. Um, there are monetary and there are non-monetary indicators that when put together, you know, and that's the key in this sort of activity. And, and, you know, for the folks in our audience who've, you know, worked fraud before, you know, it's never just one thing by itself, right? It's, it's the totality of the circumstances. It's putting the different factors together and the patterns of, of the patterns that these bad actors uh, follow in, in, in the financial side of this is, is predictable and detectable. Uh, and these systems are already in place today. So, you know, they're, they're, I don't mean to sound like banks aren't doing anything here. And like you said, you know, I mean, you know, we've seen some improvements in the SAR filing capability. There are some banks out there that are clearly leading the way, you know, and that we're very proud and happy to be working with at the Noble about understanding how they do what they do and then making that information more available to others who can learn from it and help put these, you know, help put their own programs together to be more powerful around the detection and therefore prevention of, uh, of human trafficking. Um, it's, it's, it's very detectable. And uh, just one last point on that, you know, also one of the things that we, we host a bi-monthly human trafficking roundtable, and, you know, we've got roughly 20, 20 to 30 different institutions represented on that call. And what we found through that discussion is that the majority of banks, even though they have something in place, and I say banks, it could be credit, you know, use that term generically, financial institution that has something in place, you know, the, the, the methodology, the best practices around, you know, what to do with it. We, okay, now we've detected it. What should we do? How is, what's the right way to investigate these? What's the right way to resolve this incident to the benefit of the victim, you know, and also the perpetrator? Um, you know, those are areas that, you know, the feedback from the institutions are that we, you know, they're, they're hungry for information. So there's just such an opportunity here to bring more of this information together and, and, and work collectively to help arm these folks who are reviewing these transactions with, with best practices on how to handle this. Yep. And, and to second Mike's, Mike's point, um, there's so much more to be done, but the topic is, is, is out there. It's, it's very hot now in that these institutions are talking about it in a way that historically they didn't. And I feel that uh, with so much conversation and round tables and discussion and, and, and folks like all of our respective NGOs um, speaking on this and providing tools and, 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 and ways for, for institutions to ramp up and do more, I, I think we're, we're growing to, to being in a good place. And eventually, I'm, I'm hoping within uh, the next three to five years, hopefully not much longer, there will be more of a regulatory requirement and mandate uh, and expectation yeah. from the regulators to, to act on this and add certain, certain, certain things related to anti-human trafficking and CSAM to the programs. Uh, Sarah, connection to financial services. Yeah, and I think on that point, you know, I was really excited to see FinCEN name human trafficking a anti-money laundering priority last year. And I think as the AML Reform Act um, gets rolled out and implemented, it will be really interesting to see how financial institutions um, shift and, and hopefully are able to prioritize this issue even more. Um, you know, there's a reason that um, it was named a money laundering priority and, and those priorities came um, 
often from law enforcement um, or with cons consultation from law enforcement and what the priorities needed to be. And that's because I think what Mike talked about of this, this human side of it, the, you know, the victim. Um, if we think about human trafficking cases, um, traditionally, and I think Rochelle, I'm sure, has much more experience with this, you know, they're, they're tough cases on victims. Um, a lot of prosecutions really require or really depend on a victim's testimony and their cooperation. And, you know, when you think about that, that's somebody who's experienced a lot of trauma, who's maybe in a healing process, and they're having to be interviewed again and again, they're going to have to, you know, go on record, they're going to be cross examined, um, a very traumatic experience. And a lot of individuals are, are very uncomfortable in that situation. It's not necessarily a healthy situation for them. Um, and a lot of victims are coming from segments of the population that traditionally have not been treated well by law enforcement authorities. So they don't have a lot of trust in that system and are very hesitant to cooperate. And so, um, you know, human trafficking prosecutions can be tough on victims and, and that's not a slight on prosecutors or law enforcement. That's part of our due process in the United States. But when I think about kind of including that financial crimes angle into these investigations into the and the prosecutions, I see that burden lessening a little bit. There's some mitigating factors there. Suddenly it's not just the survivor who's saying what happened and having to be questioned. You know, maybe there's transactional records that are backing up their story. So it's not just them. It's a big financial institution that's sort of supporting, you know, their account, what happened to them. And then there are situations in which maybe it's not going to work to bring human trafficking charges. Um, but maybe there are financial crimes charges that can be brought. And that's going to still bring accountability to the people who previously have been operating with very little personal risk to themselves. So this is really where I think this kind of financial crimes approach and the data and information that's supplied by the financial services industry is so critical to this crime in particular in a way that, you know, it's, I think, distinct. Um, and that's really why Polaris, you know, we only have one strategic initiative that's focused on partnership with a private sector industry, and that's the financial services industry. It's our only initiative only industry that we've kind of elevated to that level because of this very unique role that um, that industry is able to play. And I Absolutely. would, um, for any law enforcement in the room, essentially the way I say almost exactly what Sarah said, but from like the cop prosecutor angle is the, this is not an SBU crime. You're not getting a victim who outcries to you and then just putting her on her or him or they on the stand and going from there you need to look at it as a circumstantial case or like a homicide like you don't have the victim you're investigating the network the potential victim is one piece of potential information but honestly every case i prosecuted and i'm not saying this in a flip way at least half the victims were no longer living by the time we went to trial so it really is like a homicide case so you need to be building it out like an organized crime case and doing all of these investigations. And for the financial institutions who are watching, at the local level, the amount of red tape it takes for us to get records from financial institutions, to get testimony from financial institutions, and to be able to use any of that evidence in court is nearly impossible. So even at the local level, when you want to build these kind of cases, it's really difficult because of all of that red tape. So to the extent that anyone's blaming back and forth, there's not sufficient collaboration. And if financial institutions are only focused on the FBI, I hate to break it to you, that's like 4% of trafficking cases across the country. So if you're not streamlining access to all of the state and local agencies, you're, it's, I mean, sending it to FinCEN, putting it in a filing cabinet, that's not really doing much to help us prosecute trafficking. So making sure that all of the information is accessible by subpoena, that you send a certified record so that they can try to enter it in court without testimony, and that if they do need testimony, you, you work with them and at least respond to emails and try to help. I can't tell you how many times I couldn't enter financial records because we just couldn't get collaboration from the financial institution. Um, but yeah, that's what you build out the case. All of these investigations have to happen. And one thing I do want to add is it's really easy to find sex buyers and 
potential victims or sex workers. And a lot of what I see at the response level from financial institutions is closing the bank accounts of trafficking survivors and sex workers. And that's just harming both of them and making them more vulnerable to trafficking and exploitation. And that's also taking the SVU approach where you're finding the lowest common denominator and not focusing, which is, I admit, a lot more effort on finding the network and trafficker and closing their accounts and closing their access. And I know Sarah's done a lot of innovative stuff on trying to rehabilitate the credit of the victims because the primary consequence is still felt by them, not the exploiters. So we need to do a lot better job of information sharing and not just identifying the lowest common denominator and punishing people who are already living punishing lives on a daily basis. It, it's so important for us to, as financial crime professionals and, and other uh, commercial entities and folks that are, are listening on this, this webinar to, to hear this side of it. And if you're in an organization that, that right now isn't sharing information in that type of way, but you're, you are investigating and looking at potential uh, human trafficking, it's so important that you have training and that you understand how to detect it and how to differentiate human trafficking from a financial perspective from other types of um, financial crimes like structuring and tax evasion. And having that understanding and being able to identify that and not file a SAR uh, as cash structuring or tax evasion or money laundering and actually check that, that checkbox, that SAR checkbox for human trafficking is going to make a real impact and get it into the hands of investigators and folks within states and cities that are, are specifically looking for trafficking SARS and trafficking cases as opposed wanna, to... It's not going to get ahead. it into their hands. I feel like that is a misnomer. Most local agencies get denied a user login for FinCEN's SARS. That's another huge, huge issue as well. Like, all of that's that important, that. what you said, but that's not enough. Just checking the box and filing it, like, yeah. don't assume stuff's happening. And that's, that's sorry to interrupt. Yeah, and, and that's a whole other huge issue that maybe we can um, get to at the end with response and, and law enforcement, which you'll be talking on, Rochelle. But I, I do want to bring that up, and, and I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, you know, folks in institutions assume that uh, their SARS are, are getting used constantly on a daily basis by all law enforcement. And we all know that it's needed. Um, and, and not just for human trafficking, but for whatever crime you're looking at as a law enforcement professional. But only so many um, law enforcement officers in different agencies in the state, city, local, federal level actually are granted access to, to the SAR database. So maybe Rochelle can talk about that a little bit more at the end. Um, thank you, Rochelle. Moving on, um, this is our second annual summit. Uh, we had our first summit last year, uh, had over a thousand registrants uh, join representing law enforcement, uh, financial institutions, commercial industry, uh, NGOs, universities, cybersecurity folks, a variety of different professionals. And, and the big theme of, of, of our summit last year and again this year is a call to action. We want you to rally and get involved and, and care about human trafficking within your financial institution, within your role in law enforcement, within your commercial organization, if you're in retail, hospitality, transportation, what, whatever you're in. So I want to talk about how people, how the listeners can get involved and do more within their organizations if they don't know how. So to start that off, uh, we're going to go to Sarah to talk a little bit more about this. Thank you. So I think the key thing to know about human trafficking, you know, we are talking about a crime that's essentially non-consensual um, participation in an economic activity. So people being made to work against their will, being made to engage in commercial sex or prostitution against their will or not being able to consent to it because they're a minor. <clears throat> that is very diverse, what we're talking about, which means the typologies are incredibly diverse. We focus a lot on sex trafficking, but we're actually talking about, you know, um, people 
in labor trafficking situations in agriculture, which might be a huge farm, or domestic work, which might be a single individual living in a, a private household. You know, obviously, the financial transactions associated with these activities are going to look very different. And then when even within sex trafficking, there's a lot of diversity. I think there's a lot of misconceptions um, that, you know, trafficking is primarily transnational organized crime. Certainly they're involved. But as Stacey said, you know, it could also be an individual. It could be someone's family member. Um, it could be someone's boyfriend or, you know, someone that they see as their boyfriend. So it those financial transactions are also going to look different depending on how networked the traffickers are. So my big call to action is really to get educated on that diversity of human trafficking and then to start to think through, okay, where does my financial institution fit in? Maybe we don't, you know, maybe we're a small credit union, so we may or may not have touch points to one type of activity, but we may have touch points to another. Start mapping your products and services to the type of activity, economic activity you're seeing. If you have not taken the ACAMS free certification on human trafficking, please do. Huge shout out to Aaron and ATII for always promoting this. Um, the, it's free to anyone. You don't have to be a member, but if you are a member, you will get CAMS credit. If you are really short on time, I'm going to ask you just take the second part. I am biased because I wrote the second part, um, but it's a one hour um, focus on case studies. So I think it's five case studies. Each are about 15 minutes, really digestible. So just get started there. Um, and then secondly, you know, reach out to Polaris, reach out to other institutions that have all of this information and typologies um, and are able to share it. We don't always put our information on our public website because it is sensitive in nature. So please do get in touch with me. Um, we do also share um, more actionable intelligence about from public sources about individuals we suspect of trafficking. Um, so if you're in a position at a financial institution where you're able to set up that information sharing, and it's really one way sharing information because we know you're limited in what you can share back, please also contact me about it. Thank, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, please do take uh, the free resources from ACAMS and Polaris, the, the human trafficking courses, part one and two. Um, we provide it internally to all our onboarding, our, our folks, our interns, uh, and, and strongly recommend it. And, and it's free and, and share it with, with your LinkedIn and with your peer group so they can see it and see it's free too. The more folks that are educated and, and putting it out there, uh, the, the better we all are and the, and the more we, we, we can work together to, to do this. Mike, what are your thoughts on uh, call to action and getting involved? Yeah, this is, this is so key because, you know, whether it's the Noble or the other organizations, you know, sharing space with me up here today on this call, I think one thing we'll all agree on is that the staffing models for these nonprofits is not a rich model. You know, there's not tons of staff available to do this work. The power from the Noble and power from the other organizations here comes from our partnerships, comes from our network, comes from the people who volunteer, comes from the folks that want to make a difference. That is, that is very, very true. Um, with the Noble, for example, you know, our website, thenoble.com, on that website, you have, there's a link where you can apply to, to, to volunteer, basically, to help. That, that is how we get things done. That's how we execute our projects. That's how we find our subject matter experts to help build out this material, to awaken and equip and, and do some of the great things that we've all talked about here today to fight human trafficking. Um, it, Rochelle, you mentioned something that just just really resonated with me. One of the projects that we have going on um, is is around what law enforcement wishes banks knew, and and it's an effort around trying to capture and obviously you know bring more clarity on the financial institution side to some of the struggles and the hurdles and you know that maybe law enforcement you're talking about SARS and things like that and, and you know the actual throughput the action on SARS on the other end you know make that more make that more visible to the financial institution side and obviously the end result is well what can we do better to make something more actionable or get the information into the hands of law enforcement with less red tape as you were saying things like that that's a project we've got going on right now um, you know, with the, the human trafficking roundtable that I mentioned, uh, we, we have a scams roundtable that we're going to be starting up and the scams isn't the scope of this discussion, but, but for the financial institution folks on the call, 
people. I mean, scams are a big problem, and, and it's getting bigger. You know, you think uh, so. You know, we're we're trying to facilitate some inter financial institution discussions around that again to understand what's going on today and build some best practices and help get that out to the broader group because that's how we make a difference is by taking the information from you know the folks the SMEs you know everybody's everybody's good at something right we're all good at something but the power comes from when you put everybody together and that's how we make the difference so you know again you know, whether it's the noble it's it everyone else on the call you know the the, the the our power comes from the volunteers our our knowledge base comes from the folks that you know step up and see the need you know the, to to address these human crimes that we call them and and help make a difference not because it's a regulatory checkbox somewhere not because you know it, it, it's extra work that somebody needs to do it's because morally you know this is really the right thing to do Thanks, Mike. Um, so we're, we're running a little short on time, so I'm going to combine, do some on-the-fly modification here. Uh, I'm going to combine the topics of prevention and detection uh, in, into one, one piece here and, and, and ask each of you to talk a little bit about that. But you know, how can organizations, uh, law enforcement, um, the different disciplines and cross-market uh, represented here, uh, on in our summit, how can they work in prevention and detection uh, against human trafficking and 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 CSAM? Um, we'll start. I think I'll with, hold uh, off and speak since we're running short on time. I think I'll okay. wait and just speak on the um, response side, and I'll bow out of these two because I'll be redundant. Sounds good. Uh, we'll go to Sarah. Okay, so I'm going to be quick because I spend most of my time thinking about this, uh, at least on the detection side of things. Um, I did write a series of articles for ACAMS that's coming out. Um, the, the first one's out. The second article is on detecting sex trafficking, kind of the basic information to know. And the third is on detecting labor trafficking, the basic information to know. So please do keep your eyes out for those. Um, but some key information. On the sex trafficking side of things, um, a lot of indicators that people point to of indicators of sex trafficking are truly indicators that someone is um, engaged in commercial sex or prostitution, not necessarily a sex trafficking. And I think it is important for financial institutions to really have a nuanced approach to this because you want to be flagging the highest priority cases, those sex trafficking cases for law enforcement. They have a lot going on. Let them focus their energies where there are indicators of sex trafficking. Um, so a lot of the indicators of commercial sex might be, you know, transactions with a back page replacement sites like adult search, arrows, seeking arrangements. It might be payouts from OnlyFans, something like that. Not all of those people are sex trafficking victims or involved in sex trafficking. So once you see, you know, a lot of those transactions, ask yourself two questions. One, do you have reason to believe that there is a minor involved in this activity? You know, is the account holder a minor? Um, that's rare, <laughs> um, but if they are, that is extremely concerning. Or maybe you see on social media some reason to believe minors may be involved or the, the account holder does have a history of sexually exploiting minors in the past. Those are things to think about. Then secondly, is there a third party facilitator of this activity? Now, technically, a third party being present does not mean it's sex trafficking, I will say, and I know Rochelle will agree with me, it is very rare that we see a third party involved in facilitating commercial sex that isn't a trafficker, that isn't using force, fraud, or coercion to compel that person to do this activity. So think about, you know, is there someone booking a lot of travel on behalf of others? Um, are there funnel accounts where multiple women seem to be sending money to the same central person? Are they, you know, buying so much of a certain product or service that it doesn't really make sense for a single person. Things like that are questions you want to ask yourself. I think a point that was raised before that we want to highlight too is on sex trafficking situations is very, very common for the account holder to be the victim. So don't assume that the account holder is the trafficker or a perpetrator. And I, I would be interested in the Noble actually facilitating a discussion on this. And I think Mike made this point before of, okay, you find an account that you think the victim is the account holder. What do you do with that account? You, you know, you may have to close the account based on AML regulations. Is there a way to open a different account? I think that would be a really interesting conversation to be having. 
And then I do want to touch on labor trafficking. It doesn't get as much attention because it is notably harder <laughs> to detect. But think about high risk industries. So these are industries with low wage labor intensive jobs. Um, they maybe have a long history of very normalized exploitative conditions. Um, they're often geographically or socially isolated. They are made, they're fractured labor supply chains. So the use of uh, labor contractors or labor recruiters is very common. In the US um, industries would include agriculture, landscaping, hospitality, um, non-unionized parts of the construction industry. If you have accounts related to those you know, think first, do some negative news checks. Do they have a history of labor violations? And then secondly, try and figure out their payroll. Can you see where their payroll is coming from? You may not have an account where payroll is being processed, but you should have some, you know, flow of money to maybe another financial institution that suggests payroll. And if you do have payroll, look at that payroll. Is it normal? Is it too small for the size of their business? Is it not processed regularly? Like they're withholding wages from somebody until the end of the season. Um, are you seeing, you know, we have seen cases in which a paycheck to a victim was then deposited back in the trafficker's account. These are weird things that should raise red flags for you. And those are all great points. Thank you, Sarah. Stacia. Yep. I was just going to jump in to do a little bit of a yes at. So pretty much everything Sarah said in terms of engaging, educating yourself, learn the fact patterns so that you can better detect that. And Polaris, Collective Liberty, ATII, The Noble, NECMEC, any of our organizations or our organizations collectively can help you do that. In addition to that, I think we need to acknowledge expertise here and that for the child sexual exploitation elements, there's a lot of crossover. Historically, we didn't see as much crossover in terms of the production and the selling of child sexual abuse material and child sex trafficking. And that dramatically changed at the end of 2019. And we saw a uptick in the data that we're tracking related to that crossover. And now traffickers are benefiting from the sale of that child sexual exploitation material online, as well as selling the child to buyers in that local geographic area. Now, each one of those crimes usually takes a different investigative path, different charges, different expertise. So again, it's gonna be a more complicated crime to investigate, and you're gonna need partners and stakeholders within your own agencies, within your own companies and your own organizations. And again, I think that's something the organizations here on the panel can also assist you with. It's similar along that same lines, we're also seeing some changes related to how that's occurring online, specifically subscription-based sites or one-to-one -one purchases via alternative payment mechanisms. So as soon as you think you have an idea of what it looks like and what that fact pattern is, we often see that that then quickly changes and we're all having to kind of relearn it again. Um, one of the more disturbing facts that we're seeing is in the, the dissemination of child sexual abuse material online, we are now seeing a larger portion of the offender who uh, uh, took those images and videos be specifically a child sex trafficker, where that, again, was not in the past. Um, they don't make up the largest percentage, but we are seeing an increase in that area. So I would make sure you're leveraging all your stakeholders in terms of the knowledge and the expertise and the resources that you're going to need to detect and prevent this. Yep. And, and just to, to, to jump off that, it's very, with, with COVID and all the online activity that's increased, there are so many, di many different payments and companies and sources that are popping up for online streaming and your OnlyFans and the different sites. And, and, and it's very hard from a compliance perspective to understand and know, okay, which, which ones are, you know, it's a business decision to, to bank these, these type of customers and, and, and these banks and, and credit card companies and payment processors make this decision, you know, based on their, but also 
don't understand and have full picture of, of the child exploitation and other types of crimes that can be happening either behind that paywall or through. And so we're in, we're at a stage now that there's got to be a lot more guidance and a lot more detection and prevention protocols and understanding. So, so organizations are equipped to make the right decision and not unknowingly be a facilitator of, of these, these type of things. Uh, Mike. Um, this is re really great material and, and ideas being shared here. This is awesome. Just going to quickly add a couple of things. You know, the topic around prevention in human trafficking was actually something that came up in one of our roundtable discussions. And from a financial institution point of view, you know, prevention is, is not so much a transactional activity. T prevention is about training your frontline staff, creating, you know, making the red flags of human trafficking part of their annual training or, or quarterly training, whatever the training intervals are, but keeping it fresh, keeping it updating and making sure that every person in your branches, for example, that has a face-to-face -face opportunity with a customer knows what the indicators are. I mean, we train them on other AML indicators. There's all sorts of other things required by regulation that we all trained on in the financial industry. This has to become one of them. That is our real key in prevention is, 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 is when we have the chance to observe it ourselves in, in the financial industry. Then we talk about prevention and, you know, some of the things we talked about prevention very, or, or detection, I'm sorry, detection very much is a transactional monetary and non-monetary transactional type of, uh, type of an activity here. But I, I really can't emphasize the opportunity that we have um, in, in making our front lines acutely aware of, the, of what those observations they make, how important they could be. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I'm going to pass it over to Rochelle now to talk about response and the law, and law enforcement perspective uh, around that. Absolutely. Thank you. So I think the everything you all just talked about, I obviously agree. And the front line, considering yourselves, like checking the box, doing all of those things, making sure you have the process is really important. Um, but it's just kind of like, just so you know, it's ending with th that. So whatever action steps are not happening afterwards, it's ending. So some financial institutions have proactive units that are, and I know not every institution's resource, but they have proactive units that as things bubble up to a red flag, reach a SAR, they are able to dig deeper and make sure that it gets into the hands of law enforcement as needed. And they're able to make proactive decisions. I know a lot of policy has been the last five years around the Bank Secrecy Act and lightening the load on, it's now, if your institution says, okay, we can't share this information because of the Bank Secrecy Act, it's borderline an excuse at this point because the policy has lifted so much. And the goal of those policy alleviations is to make sure that we're acting on this stuff when we find it and not sitting on it. So if your internal policies and procedures are like, we checked a bunch of boxes and submitted this to the filing cabinet, that's something that I'm really urging you all to think about and adjust, to adjust to the policies as they're shifting over the last five years. Because even if we gave every local law enforcement officer access to the SARS, which we we are like not even close. It's like probably 10% have access to it in the first place. So that's that's where your SAR is going is to like nowhere. Sorry, not nowhere, but not everyone that needs to access it. But then also if you think about, okay, even if we gave all of them access, how many SARs are you filing on a daily basis? You know, like there's thousands filed everywhere. So these investigators, they're not sitting there their full-time job reading SARS. So it's still stuff's going to fall through the cracks. So that's not to blame financial institutions, but as a system, there's multiple choke points um, uh, on both ends of getting the information to each other and collaborating with each other. And law enforcement's incredibly under-resourced and overwhelmed. And the corporate opacity of working with financial institutions is notoriously difficult. So I'm inviting and begging you to take some of the first steps in that collaboration direction, because yours is a lot harder for us on our end to penetrate than it is on our end. We're ready to collaborate. And we also have strong data restrictions and requirements, but we're willing to work with what we have to get it done. And it really does feel difficult the other way around. Um, and 
I'm grateful over the past six months, I have had our law enforcement partners starting to get access to the SARS, which is new. They've been just immediately rejected for the past three or four years until the past six to eight months. So now local agencies are getting access, but it's still where there's like but fewer than five contacts for an entire state is just getting all the SARS. And somehow they're supposed to filter it for like thousands of agencies in their state and every unit that's relevant within their state. Like it's just not, it's not working. Um, so anyways, that was a little bit of a soapbox, but overall in terms of response and action, I think it's been so great and so innovative. And I know Nick Mick does a lot of great work. Sarah and I, when I was at Polaris and since I started Collective Liberty have like been tag teaming quite a bit on both ends with her working quite a bit with financial institutions and us kind of trying to find ways for both sides to meet in the middle. And there's so much hunger for it. So I'm not being critical here. I'm just saying there's so much left to be done to make sure that that information is actionable and in the hands of the people who can take action. And so one of my favorite things about ACAMS and all of the financial institution conferences is it brings the financial investigators to the table and it, it, that is the next step for making sure that all of the local task forces have what they need. If I'm an SVU investigator and my strength is talking to survivors and making them feel comfortable and building a case around them, I promise you my strength is not looking at Excel sheets and numbers. So we need that collaboration with someone whose strength is not talking to a problematic victim, but talking, but can really interpret all of that and follow up and get what you need. So that collaboration is so important. And every time I talk about that, most of the financial crimes investigators get excited because they usually don't get to work on the juicier cases like that. Um, so if you're on the call, please find your local task forces, your local trafficking task forces and volunteer to be on the task force. You will be a diamond on that task force, such a valuable asset um, because you'll understand all of this process. You'll know how to find the SARS. You'll know how to convince the banks to cooperate with subpoenas in a helpful way, in a timely way, et cetera. You'll know all this stuff that this SBU investigator is like, I can't spend full time for three weeks figuring this out right now. So that's like, we just need more direct, consistent collaboration and financial investigators can be a huge asset to that process. And, That's you know, phenomenal. We're, we're one, one, one thing too, I, I just want to throw in there to kind of cap that off, but what, what you say is so true. But in what we do, folks on this call and folks watching, you know, folks watching, there is no competitive advantage to any of us in fighting fraud and trying to, you know, mitigate these frauds, fighting, getting these bad guys, perpetrators, you know, the, the strength, it's partnerships. That's what makes us all work, working together. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that's phenomenal information. Uh, Rochelle, I was shocked to find out in, in my state uh, that um, a major agency uh, had one person that had access to SAR data. And that person had to like, basically sell themselves within the agency that her access is important to any case that you're working on, let alone just a human trafficking case. And, and it probably I, it wasn't just, even her full-time job, right? Mind. It's something she had to do on top of her rest of her workload. Yep, yep. And, uh, you know, another point I want to make, uh, aside from, from the law enforcement perspective of this, um, you know, if you're in a financial institution, think of human trafficking and CSAM the way you would think of terrorist financing. Use your, your laws and your acts. Use your 314 uh you know, U.S. Patriot Act to share information, not just with law enforcement, but other financial institutions. If you found something, if, if you came across terrorist financing or national security, you would want to cross-reference the institutions that may share an account with, with, with your customer. Do the same thing for human trafficking, because that's going to make a huge impact, and you are protected by the law under 314 of the U.S. Patriot Act. Uh, Stacia, you're up. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think really it's been covered. Um, I think that there's a lot of opportunities uh, for law enforcement and prosecutors to leverage existing efforts and work on the response to this. There's a lot of opportunities for the financial services industry to engage. And I think many of the groups are on this call 
One I did want to highlight that is not um, is the Financial Coalition Against Child Sexual Exploitation, which many of the people on this call are affiliated with. Um, and it was started by the organization, the International Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Started around 2006, specifically targeting commercial CSAM online and did an, a really effective strategy at combating that. More recently, um, it has grown to include commercial child sex trafficking online and commercial CSAM as well. So I would encourage you to look into that. I would encourage you to look into the Noble because, and all the groups on uh, the call today, uh, the panel today. And I think that where you're gonna find opportunities to help leverage the skills of the collective group to not only identify, but to find resources to respond because there are ways through those communications and through those partnerships that you find ways that you can share information that you realize isn't permitted or is permitted to be shared, not prevented to be shared. And I think that, you know, you've highlighted several times, each person on the panel has highlighted partnerships. And I think anyone trying to do it alone is not going to be effective. We know that. And I think just make sure you're aware of all the resources that are out there because these cases are really complicated to move forward and you need everyone's help because at the end of the day, it is the victims and survivors that benefit from that coordination. And that's really, I think, all of the goal of everyone that's likely attending today is to find ways to better engage and to help that population. And in the spirit of this panel, um, NGO collaboration, we, we all, each of our respective organizations, all have certain, certain capabilities and disciplines that we're excellent at, and we merge and, and blend in, in in other disciplines. But everybody here knows that, that we can call one another and collaborate on, on a case, on a topic, on a white paper, on, on a project, whatever it may be. And there's many other great uh, NGOs out there that that do great work that that each of us work work with separately um and it's important that we all work together um you know as we've we've all said um that's how the impact is is made of course um so final final thoughts quickly um let's all uh just quickly uh focus on a on a, on a few things to to wrap this up and i'll start with sarah I think the best AML or anti-financial crime <clears throat> uh, professionals I know are really curious people. They like learning new things. They like figuring things out. So I would just say stay curious um, because as Stacey said, you know, you might come up with a list of great indicators. Guess what? You're not done because those are going to shift. They'll change over time. That's the nature of the game. Um, and just, you know, continue to invest and lean into this issue. I have seen a lot of improvements um, over the last couple of years, but this isn't, you know, a project that you work on for a short period of time and then you're done. This is really a commitment that's going to be ongoing. So please do stay curious. Rochelle? However we can help, let us know. Um, we're constantly finding a lot of problems and choke points and doing everything we can to fix them. Um, I know a number of our financial institution partners, I'm just helping connect them to the right law enforcement person. That's hard in and of itself, right? So we have thousands of investigators across 46 states that we can help bridge the gap on both sides. If you want me to be the bridge from the other side, let me know. I can do that as well because they're also like, I must have sent it to the wrong place. I never heard back, blah, blah, blah. I can help solve that as well. So let us know. We're here to help as much as we can. Again, we just want to end trafficking. So that's our skin in the game. Stacey? Yeah, um, obviously, NECMEC is a resource to assist you. Um, and there's another stakeholder that I've heard referenced throughout of the various talking points today, but I want to call out is survivors. Make sure that you're including them in any effort um, that as you move forward, their expertise is some of the best that you will receive. Um, and that lived experience is incredibly valuable. So make sure you're bringing them on as paid consultants to work uh, side by side with you on this effort. 
but also to learn how to engage in helping to repair, rehabilitate, and recover the financial capabilities and the history of victims of sexual exploitation, trafficking, be it both sex or labor. Um, so I think that's an important component as well. There are, are several resources that have already been built out to do that, but you can join that effort as well. And I think that's another part that I just want to make sure everyone considers. And I heard as a theme earlier through some of the talking points. Such a very important point. Uh, Mike? So just very quickly for the group, uh, for the financial folks watching this in particular, you know, I understand the challenges of, of case volumes, uh, timelines, deadlines, filing deadlines, you know, case volumes were at, at the highest they've ever been during the COVID period um, from a fraud investigation standpoint. And sometimes it gets hard to see past that. But I just want to ask everybody, you know, again, to please be the catalyst within your organization to help bring awareness to the fact that, you know, like, like so other folks have said, and like, like I said before, you suspect human trafficking, you know, take action, check the box in the SAR. But if any contacts that you have, you know, work those cases behind every one of those transactions is like I said, it's, it's a person's, it's a person's life, it's a person's livelihood. And, uh, you know, it, it, it may not be a lost figure on the bottom line for the, for the financial institution, but again, you know, the, with the moral compass of the organization is, you know, is what we're trying to influence here too. Very important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. And, and I'm going to um, go with the theme of, of what Sarah said about staying curious and, and keeping an open mind. Uh, the climate is changing, whether you're a financial institution, law enforcement, or, or work for a, uh, a, another type of organization. The vendors, the data, the analytics, the open source intelligence, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, you know, the landscape is changing. There, there's so much data and investigation techniques available and, and criminals, traffickers, uh, bad guys are always changing and, and adapting and keeping the mindset and same way of doing things that we've historically done it is not going to solve the problem. We have to stay curious. We have to keep an open mind and we have to evolve as professionals uh, to, to fight this type of crime. Um, thank you everybody for joining and, and participating. I think this was, what was phenomenal. I think our, our viewers will take a lot away from this. Uh, this recording is also available uh, after the summit uh, to, um, to everybody that wants to review and, 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 and get this information. Feel free to reach out to myself or our, our panelists uh, on LinkedIn. Um, reach out for their email if you, if you have a case or, or are looking to work or collaborate. And thank you so much again, everybody, for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye.